just going to uh, start with what? With short, short introduction, short bios of our, of our speakers, um, who I think are known to you, many of them. Um, and yeah, Anne, Anne Wright, on my right, um, has spent 13 years in the U.S. Army and 16 additional years in the Army Reserves, from which she retired as a colonel and worked in the U.S. State Department <coughs> before resigning in 2003 on the eve of the U.S. invasion of Iraq which she considered a violation of international law. She was one of the Hancock 38 activists found guilty in December 2011 for their role in a protest against U.S. drone strikes in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Um, and has been very active in building resistance to drone <coughs> strikes and in the peace movement more broadly. She has been on delegations to Iran and Gaza three times in 2009 following the Israeli attack on Gaza that killed 1,440 and, and wounded 5,000. People. Um, she was an organizer for the Gaza Freedom March that brought 1, 000, well, many, many people um, from 44 countries to Cairo in solidarity with the people of Gaza. And she was also on the flotilla that was attacked by the Israeli army. Um, she helped organize the U.S. flotilla to Gaza, the Dacity of Hope, um, in 2011. We're really happy to have her uh, with us. Um, and I actually I began introducing people, not in the order that they will speak, but maybe I should. Um, uh, Madiha Tahir on my left, um, she's an independent multimedia and print journalist who has recently returned from Pakistan where she's interviewed and photographed individuals who have survived U.S. drone strikes or have lost loved ones uh, to such attacks. She's traveled extensively through Pakistan and Balu Baluchistan to SWAT um, as well to rural flood affected areas. Um, her work has appeared in multiple uh, publications including the National Foreign Affairs, Columbia Journalism Review, um, and many other places and democracy now. Um, she's the co-editor of a forthcoming volume, which I'm very much looking forward to, Dispatches from Pakistan with historian Vijay Prashad and editor uh, Ghalanda uh, Memon. And also we have uh, with us uh, Nada Anwadi. Yes, uh, she's a Bahraini journalist, a writer, a researcher. Uh, since 2003, she has been covering politics of human rights issues in Bahrain and the Middle East. Um, she covered the recent crackdown on Bahrain, the brutal crackdown on Bahrain for several international uh, media outlets. Uh, and she co-founded the Bahraini uh, Press Association with other prominent Bahraini journalists last, last year. Um, the association focuses on freedom of expression in Bahrain and defends local and international journalists who have been attacked or targeted by the Bahraini authorities. Um, and she's also involved in media work and women's work as well. And uh, certainly, uh, last but certainly not least, is my dear colleague, um, Mariella Hood, um, who is a senior staff attorney at the Center for Constitutional Rights. Um, she spe specializes in international human rights litigation, seeking to hold government officials and corporations accountable for torture, extrajudicial killings, and war crimes abroad. Um, her cases have included Al Awlaki Al versus Obama, which sought to prevent the targeted killing of a U.S. citizen in Yemen in violation of constitutional and international law and draw attention to expanding U.S. covert wars in Yemen and beyond. And she's uh, also involved in lots of other work, but this is the most relevant pieces, I think, for, um, for today. Um, so loosely, I think the arc of how I conceive of this uh, panel and these uh, wonderful speakers here, I, I think we're going to start by um, laying out some of the uh, political and um, ethical um, stakes uh, of uh, the targeted killings and drone strikes, which are one of the ways in which these targeted killings are happening, and beginning by looking at uh, Pakistan. Um, but I think in doing so, Medina will also not take a, a legal approach so much as a political, historical, ethical approach to what the costs of such a program are. Um, and I think from there we will go to a case um, that she's a counsel on. Um, led by the Center for Constitutional Rights, uh, challenging a targeted killing uh, program. So she will talk about, I think, some more of the legal aspects, but also possibly draw out some of the larger and the non-legal uh, stakes. Um, and then uh, from there we could go in one of two very good uh, <laughs> directions. Um, uh, maybe to, to keep going to, to discussion around drones, and what's being done around them, 
um, that might be actually a moment to turn to, to you, Anne, and you can tell us, um, give us something of the landscape um, in the United States uh, of where these drone bases are that are going and attacking um, uh, and attacking, and some of the things that are being done to resist them. And I think we'd also be quite interested in, in hearing a little bit about your own um, uh, coming to do this sort of work and activism in your own background and those uh, transformations. Um, and, and some thoughts on, on the road ahead. Um, and actually, is it, would it be bad if I reverse that with Nada? Because I think if we end with you and with, and the question I hope we all engage in, in how to go forward, what does resistance look like uh, to this, uh, uh, one, not only targeted killing policies, but also, and here Nada will come in to talk about state repression in Bahrain, and of course in Bahrain that state repression is, um, is uh, well, you elaborate on this, but backed by silent complicity by the United States um, government. So maybe then we can have a more comprehensive discussion about what um, what these expanding U.S. wars um, looks like and what uh, U.S.-backed state repression looks like and have some conversations about where to go from here. Well, I was presuming some discussion of Pakistan first, but <laughs> we'll, go ahead. we'll go ahead and start with Yemen and how the U.S. has expanded its war to Yemen, um, essentially expanding the war around the globe, um, including the drone strikes. The and you know there's been word in the last year and a half that the CIA is actually building a secret base nearby Yemen as well. Um, there's already one in Djibouti, which is where the strikes in Somalia are taking place from, which is also still very close to Yemen. So the strikes in Yemen date back to November of 2002, when there was actually a CIA-operated predator drone strike on a car in Yemen that was traveling, killing everyone inside, including a U.S. citizen. And that, again, that's 2002. Um, starting recently, in, in 2009, folks might have heard of the, of the attacks on El Majala um, in Abiyan province in the south, which were cluster munition strikes by the United States, um, essentially wiping out two extended families. 41 people were killed. 21 of them were children, 14 of them were women. Um, and that was from the strike itself. You know, from the unexploded cluster munitions afterwards, I think about 15 more people were killed. Uh, so this is a strike that initially the, the Yemeni government took responsibility for. Um, then U.S. officials came out and took took responsibility for it, um, but later a WikiLeaks document was released, a State Department cable, which basically uh, was a discussion between then President Saleh and Petraeus, where Saleh said, uh, let's see here, we'll continue saying the bombs are ours, not yours. So there was this agreement that, that Yemen would take responsibility for the strikes when they were well, really U.S. strikes. That, the, the State Department cable was from January 2010, the month after the, the Al Majala strike. Um, and of course, you know, 100 countries have signed a treaty banning cluster munitions, but not the United States, not Yemen. So there was a Yemeni journalist who actually reported on, I think first reported on, the U.S. being responsible for this strike. Um, he was then jailed on supposedly terrorism-related charges um, and sentenced to five years in prison after a sham trial. Uh, so there was outcry about this, you know, because it was clear that it was because he was a journalist and had made these reports that he was being imprisoned. So uh, word leaked out that Saleh was actually going to pardon him and he was going to be released. Then Saleh received a call from President Obama who said that he was disturbed to find out that this man was going to be released, so he's sta he is still in prison to this day. Um, there was another killing, and it, you know, all of this sort of gives you a, an idea of the political landscape and the, and the relationships between the governments. Um, there was another, in, in May of 2010, the U.S. Uh, in a strike killed the deputy governor of, of one of the provinces. Um, and this, he also happened to be a rival of Saleh. So uh, one of the government, U.S. government officials after that was basically quoted as saying, I think we got played. 
Um, in other words, you know, Saleh's feeding to the United States. Here's, here's, some, here's the Al-Qaeda, and it's his political rivals. Um, there's actually a great article by Jeremy Scahill in The Nation. Um, it's called Washington's War in Yemen Backfires. And it not only describes how the U.S. strikes, um, but also how U.S. aid to Yemen for so-called counterterrorism has backfired. So in addition to being used for political gain of the administration and for um, its own political purposes, it's also a, actually a disincentive to fight terrorism because it's a cash cow. So why would, why would they make efforts to truly eliminate um, you know, Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula uh, and dry up their funds from the United States? It's also, you know, the tribal leaders are, are extremely powerful in, in Yemen, and they, you know, like the people of Yemen, have been outraged by the U.S. airstrikes. So they also have, you know, it's also a disincentive for them to do something about um, any terrorism that does exist. So in January of 2010, it, it came, it was reported that um, U.S. citizen Anwar al awlaki was actually on a kill list. Um, he had been put there by JSOC, which is the Joint Special Operations Command, the, the covert military, the covert branch of the U.S. military. Uh, it later came out that he was also on a CIA kill list. So we, CCR, the Center for Constitutional Rights, along with the ACLU, brought a case um, claiming that under the, the U.S. Constitution and under international law, the government could not kill someone without due process, except in an armed conflict, which this was not, um, unless there was an imminent threat and there were no other options available. So we sued um, Obama, we sued Gates, and we sued Panetta, uh, arguing that they could not kill Anwar al awlaki outside of these circumstances and that the, the court should basically determine that that was the law and say that the government had to comply with that law. Um, you know, al Anwar al awlaki had had no due process whatsoever. He hadn't been charged, much less, much less tried. Um, you know, the U.S. government had, other than saying, you know, oh, he's an operational leader of al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, they haven't come out with evidence. Um, the United States is not at war with Yemen or in Yemen. The entire world is not a battlefield. And, you know, as far as whether Anwar al awlaki was an imminent threat, you know, he's, he had been on this list since January 2010. Um, there's no indication that he was an imminent threat. So we allege that under the Constitution, you know, such a killing would violate the Fourth Amendment um, protection against unreasonable seizures because taking a life or apprehending someone by the use of deadly force is a seizure, and it would violate the Fifth Amendment um, due process right of, of having due process before being deprived of one's life. Um, and that due process means, you know, pursu pursuant to a sentence imposed after a trial and conviction based on proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, you know, we also argued under international law uh, such a killing would violate the law um, because, you know, unless, again, it was because lethal force being used because of a concrete, specific, and imminent threat of death or serious injury, and that that force would be only used as a last resort. Um, and that, you know, last resort means there has to be a constant reassessment of the need. It's not just you decide, you know, a year and a half before that someone's a threat. So the government moved to dismiss the case on standing grounds. We actually represented, we did not represent Anwar al awlaki we represented his father. Anwar al awlaki at the time was in hiding in Yemen. We couldn't communicate with him. Um, the, they also moved to, the, the court, I mean the defendants, the government, also moved to dismiss the case based on what's called political question grounds, claiming this is actually a decision for the executive, not a decision for the courts. The courts have no business um, playing a role in here. And they finally, they moved to dismiss it on state secrets grounds, saying anything about this is secretive. You know, whether he's on a list, whether we have a list, what he's done, um, that would all be a state secret. So, and they claimed that we are at war with Al-Qaeda, and that Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula which they claimed Anwar al awlaki was an operational leader of, 
was either part of Al-Qaeda or closely associated with Al-Qaeda, so that we can go ahead and, and strike um, their leaders as well. So the district court, this was in the district court of DC, um, Judge Bates, he agreed with the government. He dismissed the case based on both standing and political question grounds. He didn't reach the state secrets issue. For standing, he basically said, you know, Anwar al could have come and turned himself into the U.S. Embassy and gotten a lawyer that way, or, you know, he could have emailed with us or something, you know, so it was kind of ridiculous. He was in hiding. If he came out of hiding, he would get killed. But regardless, he didn't, you know, he wasn't, um, the case couldn't proceed because he didn't bring it himself. Um, the court also found that it was a political question, not a legal question, whether or not the president could decide to kill a U.S. citizen in hiding overseas who they determine are an operational member of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and that there's no judicial review available. So it's interesting because the court also acknowledged that it's a drastic measure to kill a U.S. citizen and that the decision was unsettling um, and noted even that you need judicial review to surveil a U.S. citizen abroad but you don't need judicial review to kill a U.S. citizen abroad. Um, yet, still came to the conclusion that you don't. So, um, then eventually, in, in September of last year, Anwar al was in fact killed by a U.S. drone strike. Um, with him was another U.S. citizen, Samir Khan, who was also killed. This, interestingly enough, was a week after, so this is when Saleh had been in Saudi Arabia for three months. Um, and Saleh returned, and a week later, Anwar al Aliki was killed. So it's, it's sort of thought that this was the last card that Saleh had to play. You know, government, U.S. government, back me. Here, I'll give you what you wanted, Anwar al Aliki. Um, two weeks later, October 14th, <coughs> Anwar al Aliki's 16 year old. U.S. citizen son was also killed in a drone strike, along with his 17-year-old 17-year-old cousin and five other people. Um, the you know unofficial sources claimed that they were going after someone else who wasn't killed, um, but that seems questionable. Of course, the reports right after right after Abdul Rahman was killed, the son, uh, were that he was a 21-year-old Al Qaeda militant when in reality he was a 16-year-old um, who had gone, who had previously left to go look for his dad. Uh, the, that didn't come out, of course, until the family released his birth certificate showing he was born in Colorado. Um, so the, you know, what do we know about the, the U.S.'s justification? Hardly anything. Um, what they've said in the case we know there's, evident, there's evidently a Department of Justice Office of Legal Counsel memorandum justifying um, why a U.S. citizen could be killed. Um, of course, they refuse, the government refuses to release that, claiming the legal justification is secret. Um, but that does not prevent, you know, Holder from speaking about it at Northwestern Law School a few weeks ago, of course. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, we believe, of course, that the U.S. government needs to be held accountable um, for these crimes and for the endless expansion of war um, and that the war paradigm itself needs to, needs to stop, um, as well as the, the unchecked executive power. You know, if, if anything, there just, there has to be judicial review or we just don't have a democracy and it undermines our constitution as well as, as international law and the rule of law in general. So I think I'll leave it there, and then we can. Can we ask you a couple of Yeah, do, do you want to do it now, or do you want to wait until uh, later? I think we're going to wait until later, if that's OK. As um, Bailey mentioned, I've sort of I've been in, in uh, Pakistan, actually, speaking with um, survivors of, of drone strikes and families of victims. But what I wanted to start with talking about was um, were, was you know in Pakistan there's a, there's there's confusion. I think a lot of times journalists go to Pakistan they find people who are actually supportive of the drone attacks and so there's there's confusion about whether people in Pakistan support the drone attacks or don't support the drone attacks. And I wanted to actually start by talking about um, 
Pakistani um, liberals, that is, English-speaking um, elite in Pakistan, who are the people that one is most likely to encounter as a foreign journalist in Pakistan. And these are the people that are most likely to, um, to support drone attacks. And um, so if you're getting, uh, getting your, you know, sort of uh, uh, some uh, ideas about what Pakistan, uh, how Pakistan is, uh, how Pakistanis feel about drone attacks, and you're speaking largely to this group, they tend to be people who are, as I said, English-speaking, fairly well-educated. Some, some of them themselves have been journalists and then sort of moved on into the NGO sector. And they're a very small class of people. But the reason I'm talking about them is because um, they have a certain amount of influence because these are the people that write in the English language newspapers, which again are what are most likely to be accessed by foreign journalists who don't speak any of the local languages. Um, and they have all sorts of intersections, They'll, everything from hosting parties, you know, for journalists, hosting them in their homes, to, um, you know, having intersections with international NGOs or think tanks. So there's a lot of influence that they have in terms of Pakistani politics, even if numerically they're a very small group of people. Um, so, I mean... Having said that, I kind of I want to talk about the ways in which um, in which modern warfare is being fought, and it's typified in two ways. One is the drone, and the other is the suicide bomber. Um, the drone, I would like to say, is sort of a, a you know it's the it's the latest in a very long trajectory of aer aerial warfare. So, for example, this is a um, uh, a drawing from a 1938 uh, Daily Mail uh, uh, paper, and what you see here is a policeman airplane, that's what the title of this photo is, um, hovering over what seem to be Arabs, um, basically. One of them with a curved sword, and the other one wearing, you know, they're both wearing Arab headgear. Um, and in fact, when um, aviation was becoming a real possibility, flight was becoming a real possibility, it was in fact in this context, that is of Europe controlling its subject populations. Um, and that was very much part of the imagination um, around flight. And in fact, the series Tarzan in some way comes out of that, the idea of the white man sort of jumping over African jungles. Um, and so, you know, the first, some of the first people on whom uh, aerial bombing was used were in fact Arabs and um, in, and including in in, uh, in Waziristan, the area in Pakistan today where the drone attacks are happening, was then subject to um, severe months-long aerial bombing by the British. Um, so these are people who are fairly used to this. This is not the first time this phenomena is occurring in their in their areas. Um, so I, in that sense, I would say that you know. The drone is also today has come to be part of the calculus of human rights. So some people might have seen this um, article in the New York Times. It's from January 30th of this year, and it makes the argument that the um, State Department should, you know, fly or that we should fly. You, we, as in the United States, should fly missile uh, drones over Syria and other places in order to monitor human rights. Um, so in that sense, I mean, you can, you can see that, that on the, you know, the surveillance state, the idea of surveillance is becoming, you know, is, is coming to be part of, of um, even uh, liberal politics in the United States. And I think even in the left, for example, OWS in, um, in Poland uh, recently, I think last year, um, flew a drone, a small, I mean, actually you can get these things. You can get cheaper versions of them for a couple hundred dollars on the internet. Obviously not the kinds that shoot missiles, but the kind that can surveil. And um, they flew them in Poland um, to actually, as a way to surveil the police that were coming to counter the protesters. Um, which is interesting, but I think one might want to think about what we're doing when we're using this technology, which is about fundamentally about surveillance, right? It's not just a tool that can, you know, is it a tool, I guess? I would pose it as a question, so I, I don't have the answer myself, but I worry that it's, it's not... It's not just a tool that can be picked up by the left or the right and used. It is a tool that is used for surveillance, whether the left does it or the right does it. The question is one of surveillance. 
Um, so in any case, in that sense, the drone is kind of coming to be part of the rational calculus of becoming human, right? Of, of we, we are going to... And you can see, for example, that if another country like Pakistan or uh, Cameroon, for example, suggested the idea of flying drones over American airspace in order to surveil for human rights, how absurd that would sound. And I think the reason, you know, the, the reason I'm pointing out the absurdity is because I think it highlights the fact that an idea like drones for human rights is actually backed by the idea of American force, American military force. That's exactly what makes it seem reasonable in the larger context. Um, so what is a drone essentially? Um, and this is a quote by a uh, Pakistani um, <coughs> author who's often um, in, published widely in Pakistan as well as in the sort of liberal to left press in the United States. It's Pervez Hadboy. He's a nuclear uh, scientist by training, but he writes about war and anti-war and all kinds of things. And this is a quote from Zenet, and he says, a drone of the kind discussed here, that is in his article, is a programmed killing machine. By definition, it is self-propelled, semi-autonomous, and capable of negotiating difficult local environments. Remote handlers guide it towards an assigned target. A drone does not need to know why it must kill, only who and how. They have drenched Pakistan in blood, both of fighters and non-combatants. But um, actually, Pervez Hudboy here isn't talking about a drone in the technical sense. He's actually talking about suicide bombers. That is people who use their body as a tool, as a weapon. So for him, um, obviously he, he sees them as a kind of a drone, and this language is very much, here's another quote from the same article, Pakistan has many more drones than America, they are mullah trained and mass produced in madrasas and militant training camps. So you can start to see where this logic is going, right? We, as in, no, I mean Pakistanis, uh, have drones, we have them much more than America. That is, the human, that is the suicide bomber, has been reduced to somebody who is very much like a technical instrument by Hood Boy. Somebody who has no logic, somebody who is utterly irrational, somebody who does something because uh, he, ha you know, he, as an, an it now, it's become an it, has a remote handler who tells him, or it, what to do. Um, so, and then here's another article, um, another quote by a different, very well-known columnist. This is in Dawn, which is one of the oldest English language dailies in Pakistan. And the article was titled Religiomania, and he says, quote, This mania has generated a childlike stubbornness in which all avenues of reason and rationality are purposefully blocked. So now you can begin to see again, it's, it's coming, you know, that logic that, I've, that I'm talking about is coming to focus on religion as a node of fanaticism and irra irrationality. Here's another one, this is again, this is from Viewpoint Magazine. Viewpoint Magazine is a recently relaunched publication. Viewpoint was around in the, I think, the 60s in Pakistan, and it was a, a leftist publication. It has recently been relaunched to, kind of, to bring leftist ideas, socialist, Marxist ideas, um, to the broader public. But here again, this is um, uh, a quote in, uh, from viewpoint and says, quote, in a society dominated by traditional religious values, heroism often means committing some violent and self-destructive act for preserving honor. So the reason I'm pointing this out is, again, you can see there's a certain kind of consensus between liberals, Pakistani liberal um, media and leftist media in terms of envisioning Pakistan as a religiously fanatic society, as a society, as religion, as, as fanatic and as a society bound by traditional religious values, which, e which end in self-destructive acts. <coughs> Here's another quote. They, as in the Muslims, feel powerless because of the situation created by their resistance to modern knowledge. Again, this is Express Tribune, which is another English language daily in, in Pakistan. These dailies, again, are read by far fewer people, the English language circulation is one to seven, that is seven times more, uh, the Urdu press circulates seven times more than the English language press. Um, but the reason I'm highlighting this is because it's important for the international uh, intersections. That is, <coughs> these are the people that influence international policy and that intersect with uh, the policymakers and um, 
storytellers that come from abroad to Pakistan. So in that sense, this is very important. So basically, we have a situation where um, um, we have a situation where Pakistanis of this class are part of a cycle uh, and delve into the most wretched forms of Islamophobia, essentially. Things that probably would not be okay in the liberal, American liberal press. Or not so blatantly in any case. So what happens to people who are actually on the receiving end of this logic? Um, this, um, well, so for example, we have, let me actually sketch out a few more things before I get to Kareem. Um, we actually now have a situation where um, the Islamists are not entirely incorrect when they actually uh, criticize this class for, um, for a discourse that is very similar to the Islamophobic discourse in Pakistan. Right? And they're not, they're not entirely wrong when they, when they sort of note the hypocrisy of this class in terms of the rule of law. For example, um, the Pakistani army's um, operation on, its, on, on Pakistan's own territory in Salat and its multiple operations in the northern tribal areas have been backed by exactly this class of people. And the justification, the logic, is that you know, these people, these irrational others, don't, um, uh, don't, uh, uh, don't respect the rule of law, they don't respect human rights, therefore we must kill them, right? So the idea is that, you know, in order for a world that, that respects human rights, we have to actually exterminate some people, right? Um, so and in this discourse, you will often hear them lament about uh, the situation of minorities. So for example, Christians, or Ahmadis, which is a minority uh, Muslim group that is um, outlawed in Pakistan in the sense that they cannot call themselves Muslim, uh, Hindus and others. And um, in a way, what they do is they tend to say, look, look, look at our Hindu brothers, look at our Christian brothers, look at our Ahmadi brothers, look at the situation in which they have been put by the, by the fanatics. Right? So again, these, these minority communities are appropriated in a discourse to justify further killing. Um, of the supposedly savage Islamists. And it's in this context that um, I wanted to talk briefly about um, Salman Tasir. I've, you guys probably don't know him. He was a, he was a um, governor of Punjab, which is Pakistan's largest province. He was killed by his bodyguard um, last year. And he was killed because um, he comes from, obviously, a very, very wealthy family, liberal. Um, and he was killed because um, he backed the, uh, there was a poor Christian laborer, a woman, who uh, was charged with blasphemy, and actually she's still in jail. Um, and he went and he met her in jail. Um, and th this became a national issue, and the Islamist parties, you know, wanted her to be tried for blasphemy. You know, lines, battle lines were drawn, essentially, and he went and he um, met with her as this controversy was rising, and it was, it, was, it was a courageous thing that he did, and it cost him his life. Um, but the thing I want to point out is that Saman Dasir was not only just this single courageous act, he was also a lifelong capitalist who was known for his, um, uh, for his uh, incredibly exploitative labor practices, um, but you will never hear about any of that. So, you know, for, for Saman Dasir, for example, you, um, the woman who is in jail, right, she's in jail because she's Christian the due to blasphemy, right? But the, but the reality is that she's also in jail because she's a poor laborer. And the same system that kept Tasir wealthy and rich um, is, the, is the system that kept her poor and kept her as a, as a, as a poor Christian laborer. Um, and the, the fact of class is never discussed in these, in these contexts. Um, and neither are, I mean, um, his daughter, among others of his family, have been, you know, for countless times, been interviewed um, about this episode and about the fact that um, the kids lost their, their, their father. But you will never hear um, any of the interviewers ask, the, ask, you know, ask the family about um, the labor practices of their sort of sprawling, uh, of their sprawling businesses. Um, 
So my point here basically is that the liberal class gravitates towards a politics of personal expression. And by personal expression I mean you know, your right to eat or drink or whatever you want or to dress however you want, which is fine. It's an important you know, aspect. But the problem is that these things are not divorced from um, questions of redistributive justice questions of economics, which are things that are never discussed in this context and would call for a very different kind of politics if they were discussed. It wouldn't simply be about my right to wear what I want. Um, so now I want to come to Kareem. So what happens to those that are sort of um, not able to present themselves as empathetic subjects? So for example, if, if Christians and Ahmadis and Hindus can be appropriated into the liberal discourse, as empathetic, worthy of some kind of empathy um, and, and perhaps saving. What happens to people who are not worthy of that? Um, and so this is um, Karim Khan, and he uh, lost his brother and his son in a 2009 um, uh, drone attack. This is his home after the attack. Um, and they claim that they had killed uh, Mullah Omar in this in this attack, um, and actually three people were killed. His, his next door neighbor was also killed. Um, and his brother was actually an English language masters, um, and he was a teacher, and he loved poetry. And he was nicknamed Iqbal um, after the sort of famous South Asian uh, poet Iqbal, um, and his son was. Um, a Quran -e Hafiz, which means he had somebody who had committed the Quran to memory. Um, and he worked as a security guard at a local um, primary school. This is um, Iqbal, the brother, Karim's brother. This is um, a photo of through the casket. Um, this is the son, Zainullah Khan. Um, another shot of his home. This is my, uh, another person, Mashad Khan. Um, and Mashad actually lost his uncle's son, that is his nephew, um, who was between 15 and 17 years, or sorry, between uh, 17 and 18 years old. Um, you'll notice, I mean, a lot of these people are not able to, for example, they don't mark time in the same sense that that, you know, calendrical time in the sense that we do. So if you ask them their age, they're, they're all approximations. Um, if you ask them about the date of the drone attack, that is also often an approximation. Um, they also, they don't have family photos. So the question becomes like, how do you humanize people who are, who are, um, who don't have sort of the detritus of, you know, daily life that most of us produce with our little cell phone videos or whatever it is that we do in daily life to record our time on earth. Um, these people don't, don't have that and for the most, if you ask them for a photo, um, they'll have a, a passport photo, um, which is what they can give you. This is Sadallah. He is um, somewhere between 15 and 17 years old. He lost both his legs um, in, a drone, in a drone attack. He also lost his grandfather's brother, his uncle, and a nephew. Um, and um, he only recently got these, I think, prosthetics. He was telling me that he's in pain and he's still in the process of getting this, getting, um, um, getting used to them and sort of has to do these daily exercises, but it's kind of ended his daily life. I mean, he used to love to play cricket, as most Pakistanis do, and not really able to do that um, anymore. It's changed his life in a, in a lot of ways. Um, this is Fahim Qureshi. He's also young, um, uh, uh, young, I think around Sadallah's age. I don't have it in front of me. He's sh actually showing me his left eye, which is a glass eye. He's, he, he lost that eye in a, in, a, in a drone strike along with um, family members again. This is um, He's unfortunately named Saddam Hussein, but a cute kid. Um, he lost his, um, he's 16 years old, and he's, he lost his um, uh, sister-in-law and his uh, seven to ten month uh, 
old niece. Um, he's smiling because uh, his phone started ringing in the middle of our interview and he's, he was really shy, but a, a good talker. Um, this is a photo of his, um, of his niece, again, a funeral photo. Um, and then what I want to end with is just a quote from Karim Khan, and he says, You know what militants are? They're those who kill others, like America did to us. They should be called terrorists. We're innocent. What do we have? If we'd gone to the U.S. and committed terrorism and killed people there, then you could have called us terrorists, no problem. But we're living in our homes and we aren't safe. And on top of that, they claim we're terrorists? That's the height of cruelty, isn't it? Um, I'm ending with this quote because I think the logic of this quote is quite sound. Um, but this is a quote that doesn't have traction in the modern media at all, right? Because um, the ability to name and call people terrorists or victims or perpetrators or whatever is ultimately held by, um, by those in power. Um, so even though I find the logic of this out, I'm, I'm struck that this, this is a quote that um, it reverses the logic, and I think it's quite sound, but it's something that, that is not often um, explained or said so explicitly and so baldly. Um, so I'll just end there. Thank you all for uh, being here. Uh, my name is Nadal Wadi, and I am a Bahraini journalist. Uh, I was born and raised in Bahrain. I came to the States uh, seven months ago. I'm based in D.C. now. I'm actually going to catch a plane in like uh, 40 minutes. <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, Bahrain, um, I mean, this is a very interesting discussion, and I think uh, Bahrain um, is such an interesting story that uh, uh, counter many points that have been discussed, uh, I guess, in this whole um, uh, forum. Uh, my country, Bahrain, first of all, is, the, is this very small island in the, in the Gulf region. Uh, we are neighbors with uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Oman, uh, basically part of the GCC, the Gulf Corporation Council, which is uh, an area uh, very well known for being uh, very rich with oil, a uh, very strong ally to the United States, and an important one too. Uh, what happened uh, last year uh, was uh, transforming for all of us, I guess, in, in so many ways. Uh, obviously, you know, you heard about the Arab Spring and everything that happened. Uh, in, in the Middle East and in the Arab world. Uh, I still remember myself in Bahrain in front of, of the Egyptian embassy uh, back in January 2011, among many, many Bahrainis who were supporting the, you know, the Egyptian people and uh, you know, asking Mubarak to step down and all of that. This was a wave that was very, very strong actually and swift through the whole um, Arab world. Uh, we had all reasons, anyone who knew Bahrain before, uh, knew that uh, we had uh, all kinds of reasons for a movement to start. Uh, we have had a, a prime minister who, was in, who is still actually in power, uh, who have been in power for m over 40 years, more than Mubarak himself. He's very well known for being uh, very corrupt. Uh, and uh, there have been so many uh, I mean, demands before uh, in, in the history of my country to change the royal family or something like that. First of all, it's, uh, it's a monarchy. The system is, we are a monarchy, we have a royal family who have been, uh, you know, uh, let's say, uh, dominating the wealth and dominating the, the ruling of the country for over 200 years. And uh, this obviously created uh, many, many problems in terms of uh, practicing democracy. Even though we have had, let's say, a reformation project uh, in 2000 where we started, uh, you know, having a, a, a parliament and electing members in the parliament. But the question was always, you know, is this really a real democracy? So we do elect all, all these members in the parliament. Do they actually have any authority to change anything in the ground? Which was, after practice, obviously, was proven that this was not the case. So anyway, back to uh, 2011, uh, early 2011, where. Uh, Tunis, Tunisia happened, and then Egypt happened, and then Bahrain was actually the third. People went on the streets uh, demanding, you know, uh, democracy, uh, reformation, human rights, all of that, release of the prisoners, and, and all of that. It was great. Everyone was uh, feeling this, uh, there is freedom in the air. 
the government obviously decided to crush them, so they used violence, they attacked many of them by night, I remember, obviously started in, 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 in social media, in, in this, uh, you know, uh, big monster now that is starting everything. But anyway, starting in social media and uh, people went on the streets and, uh, in the, in, by, in, during the daytime we did not really uh, feel that this is going to be big, but then the government decided to use obviously <coughs> violence against all these protesters. So by night one person was killed and we all felt that this is not going away. This is going to be bigger and this actually happened. So by uh, this, the following day, uh, I'm, I'm actually outlining these days because they are very significant in this story. Uh, February 14th and February 15th, people decided to go, hundreds of thousands of people actually. And the population on my country, by the way, is less than a million. It's a very tiny island, 500,000 <coughs> citizens, that's it, and, and half of the population are foreigners. So. Um, a lot, I mean, almost the majority of the people went on, uh, basically uh, marched into the middle of the capital, Manama, camped there following the Egyptian scenario, and, uh, and decided not to leave until the government made their demands. Um, as usual, uh, the government decided to crush them. There were attacks against them. Many people have been killed during these attacks. This was really horrifying for all the Bahrainis. Nobody expected that this will happen, but it did. Uh, and uh, obviously, um, I mean, in one night, actually, there was a, a massive attack against all these protesters who were sleeping at dawn in, in the Per Roundabout, which is the middle uh, area in Manama capital. Uh, there is this beautiful monument it's called uh, the Per Monument. It's demolished, was demolished afterwards. Uh, and. Uh, in, you know, everyone went in shock, basically. Seven people were killed in one day, which was something really big for a tiny island. And afterwards, obviously, uh, uh, the government started the, the emergency law, where they started attacking everyone. Uh, uh, political leaders, the protesters, uh, there was, uh, obviously, the media was a, a, this kind of hatred machine that had been going on against the protesters and all of them. Uh, something uh, significant here, the majority of the population in Bahrain, 70 to 75 percent are Shia Muslims, and the minority are Sunni Muslims, and the, the ruling family is a Sunni uh, Muslim, so minority Sunnis are ru ruling Shia majority, which was always very significant in discussing Bahrain. Obviously, the government de decided to use this card because uh, mo the majority of the people who were demonstrating were uh, Shia, so they said, okay, so this is a religious movement allied with Iran, and, and these guys want to do this just to crush the, let's say, the, you know, the, the movement and the, the demands of the population, even though they were demanding rights and nothing religious was uh, there. Um, anyway, so this actually lasted for a month, and then there was the, the status of emergency law, and people were, uh, I mean, hundreds of, uh, I mean, hundreds were, uh, jailed and tortured and, and thousands were uh, uh, sacked from their jobs and, and then obviously so many horrible stories have been documented afterwards. Uh, one very important thing that I want to mention here is the media blackout. Uh, this whole story that has been going on that uh, me and many of my family and friends have been seeing every single day, the rest of the world don't really see. Why? Because there is a media blackout. Uh, and uh, there are reasons for that. First of all, this is a, uh, the country that can afford uh, paying millions of dollars to PR firms and lobbying firms in Washington, D.C. and other capitals in the world to show the world another image, to, to portray the, the struggle in another, in another way. So what, when you read about Bahrain, you might not actually read about Bahrain a lot even though the struggle is still uh, going on every single day. Uh, but when you read about Bahrain, you will get the, the, you know, the, the image that there is a conflict between Shia and Sunni, and the government is implementing some reforms, and everything is fine, it's taken care of. And uh, we know that this is not true, and we know that uh, these efforts that all these PR firms have been doing for many, many months uh, were uh, very, very good actually. <laughs> they have uh, kind of changed the image and affected the political decision in some way. 
Um, second, and this is um, important here, in general, with a lot of, I mean, there are so many different uh, discussions and arguments here, but in general, uh, obviously, the United States and the West in general is not in favor of any political change in Bahrain. And why? Bahrain is hosting one of the very important bases in the, in the Gulf region. We actually have the United States Fifth Fleet, the Navy, in Bahrain have been there for uh, decades and, and it's, uh, they, it's not in favor. I mean, basically the United States is not in favor of changing it, relocating it or having any kind of instability in, in that sense. So what is happening in this tiny island is affecting this particular interest. And second, obviously, uh, something very significant, what happened with Bahrain is that, uh, you know, the crackdown was mainly done by uh, our neighbor, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabian troops actually entered the country with the tanks and, uh, and uh, their army to make sure that no change will happen, no democratic change will happen because basically it will open a door for democracy in the region and this is something that uh, Saudi Arabia will never tolerate. And obviously, Saudi Arabia is one of the biggest allies to the United States, and, and this was, uh, you know, we cannot discuss a Bahrain politics here in the United States or discuss the decision-making about Bahrain uh, without mentioning this particular relationship, Saudi Arabia and their interest in the region, and, and obviously the oil and all of that. So this is one thing, and uh, have been a factor for a very long time, Besides, the, obviously, the, the media blackout, so uh, local journalists have been silenced. International media have been, for a very long time, not allowed to enter the country. And if they got visas, they will go inside, escorted, and they won't really see what is happening on the ground. Uh, and those who actually managed to get in the country during this past year, um, for example, Nick Kristof, the New York Times uh, correspondent, reported uh, many, many stories from the ground about the usage of tear gas, particularly. Uh, tear gas, which is made here in the United States. Uh, this, is a, this is like a routine now, every day, in every village in Bahrain. There is tear gas being fired on people in their homes. In fact, in this very month, uh, so far, seven people have been killed just because of tear gas being fired on their homes. Uh, because they don't want people to go outside to demonstrate or, or protest. And uh, many people, obviously, for some time in Egypt and, and, and in Bahrain and different countries, those guys managed to find these uh, cans, the tear gas cans, with the label you made in USA. And now they don't see it, nobody knows. And, and this is leading me towards, I think, a very important uh, point that I want to mention, which is, the arms sale. There was an arms sale uh, that was going through actually. Uh, arms sale uh, from the United States to Bahrain, $53 million arms sale that the United States actually is going to sell these arms to the Bahraini government. And this was a big issue, obviously. This was something that had been uh, discussed a lot in, in the hell. Um, there have been many, many members in the, in the House of the, the Congress uh, who were opposing this, they were saying that, you know, we should never sell arms to uh, governments who are oppressing their own people, using them against them. And Bahrain is an example. So they, there was a, a legislation uh, uh, presented uh, so, uh, to make sure that the, before selling these arms, uh, certain, uh, certain demands need to be met uh, by the Bahraini government. And now you come with politics. So when you talk, discuss this, how can you make sure that these demands have been met? You will have different, uh, let's say, pillars in the United States government. You have the, the uh, State Department with their very diplomatic uh, dialogue and speech and discourse, saying that, you know, yeah, okay, there have been some, uh, you know, uh, reforms have been, been implemented, and I think Bahrain is in the right track. You will find the, the Pentagon, and these guys will never actually tolerate that even discuss any change in Bahrain because obviously the, the only thing they are looking at is the army, uh, the base, and Iran, which is our neighbor. And, uh, and then you have uh, many other groups, obviously the, the, the Senate and the House have been very supportive because they understand that there have been so many human rights violations in this country and that something needs to be done. But then their voice might be not be that uh, 
uh, uh, heard uh, as much as, as, as the others. So, um, you know, these issues are still going on and, and it's not, we don't see, even though it's a, a lot of pressure from many activists here, uh, not just Bahrainis, even Americans who have adopted the case, they knew that this is some kind of, uh, obviously, uh, hypocrisy uh, dealing with m movements in, in different ways. So, for example, uh, and I'm a journalist, this is something that I know very well. If someone wants to write about Syria, for example, you will write or report or do something about it, you will find many people who are uh, willing to listen. But you, if you want to talk about Bahrain, for many reasons that we understand, you might not have or find many people who are willing to listen or support or do something, officials mainly. So, you know, many people have been criticizing this particular behavior and having double standards and dealing with movements who are basically demanding the same thing. All these guys in the Middle East in general are demanding the, the same thing. Uh, but the problem is the interest actually plays a very important role in, in distinguishing uh, what the United States or the West in general, uh, what their stand would be towards all these uh, movements. Um, anyway, I, I don't want to take a long time, uh, but uh, if any of you is interested in actually knowing more about uh, the struggle in Bahrain and all of that, uh, there is a, a very amazing do documentary that has been uh, produced by Al Jazeera English. It's called uh, Shouting in the Dark. It became very famous. They actually just won a second prize for that. and It was a, a very good journalist, uh, journalistic uh, piece. Uh, they these guys have been on the ground and they captured the, the whole essence of the movement and what happened. They have also released some uh, critical uh, uh, videos about the stands uh, of the United States and, and all of that. And, um, and you know, I think um, this story in particular, even though it's talking about a very small country in the Middle East, but it shows so many contradictions of uh, you know international policies and and how basically um, interest will uh, somehow determine the you know political decision making in general. Thank you. And for those of you who came um, late, I suspect that you won't know who Anne is, but I'll just give her another quick line of um, introduction. Uh, a, a long time, uh, well, she's a, a retired colonel and a long time State Department diplomat who. Um, well, who, who left um, the State Department uh, over Iraq, the Iraq War in 2003, um, and has been sort of an incredibly uh, ethical and engaged part of the anti-war movement and has done a lot of work uh, specifically around drones. So we're very happy to have you and then bring in all these conversations and turn it over to more Thank you. questions and what's next. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Well, before you leave, because I heard you say you're going to yeah. have to take off, oh, before right. you leave, I want to introduce you to someone who mm -hmm. has just recently been to your country. Okay. Paki Whalen, right here, was part oh of the U.S. De delegation okay. that went to Bahrain. Oh, witness Bahrain? Yes, to okay. witness Bahrain. And we have two other people that I know are at the conference that are also in Bahrain, Madea Benjamin. Yeah. Yeah. And Ty Berry. Yeah. And then I know Kathy Kelly was trying to get in, but she didn't get in. Um, let's see. Billy Kelly. Pardon? Billy Kelly. Billy Kelly Billy did. Kelly he, was, he, he was in there. He was in there. Yeah, okay. Brian Terrell. Brian Terrell got yeah. in. Uh, let's see. Huweda Arif got, got in. Yeah. Radhika. Yes. So to say, as one of the things I want to talk about is, you know, international activism and how uh, so many people that are at this conference have been not only trying to educate our own. Americans hear about U.S. foreign policies, but are also trying to work in solidarity with the wonderful groups that are in in um, Bahrain and Pakistan. I don't know that we've had anyone go to Yemen, uh, but in general, where the conflict areas, the, these groups of wonderful Americans are there to challenge their own government's policies. And uh, as you mentioned, I was all too much a part of that government for all too long, <laughs> for nearly four decades. So I'm glad I'm. I'm out of that and trying to uh, recover from it, I guess. <laughs> and I'd also like to mention that I want to thank both of you all as members of the Center for Constitutional Rights, as one of the premier organizations in the United States that helps defend all of us when we get in, in difficulty with our own government. And 
Maria particularly has been very helpful for us with the Gaza Freedom Flotilla and the American citizens that were on that to include helping the family of the American citizen, one of the nine that was murdered, executed on the Marvi Marmara, uh, Furkan Doan, uh, and uh, it's CCR that's been helping to try to get a, to push the American government to do what it must do, which is investigate the execution of its own citizen, something that it hasn't done yet. But you all were very successful in getting a whole treasure trove of Freedom of Information Act documents from the State Department. So this, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And, um, Madiha, um, I want to thank you so much for bringing to us uh, from in person your meeting with the families of people who have been executed by, by U.S. drones. And as a person who is uh, uh, working to educate our American people also, although I haven't had the experience that you have of, of going to Pakistan and actually talking to uh, the families of the victims. It is so important that we, we use the materials that do come back and talk about the stories and the individuals here that, that we now have learned about and others that we know from other uh, reports, Kathy Kelly being one of the ones and Mary Dean who's been in, Pac in Afghanistan. <coughs> Were you also in Pakistan? No. Okay. And with, Iran. And Iran. Yeah, with the voices of creative nonviolence. And um, um, to talk about these horrible weapons that the United States is using, horrible weapons that the CIA is using in Pakistan. I mean, for God's sakes, the CIA, what's it doing, you know, running drones? I mean, it's bad enough the U.S. military where you might think, well, it's at least a military weapon, but what's the CIA doing? I mean, a total completely, totally illegal operation by the U.S. government that has already killed between 2,500 and 3,000 people just in Pakistan alone. And then you look at what's been going on in Afghanistan just week after week after week, and then in Yemen, what we're doing with impunity there in Somalia, and what we're doing God knows where else, and maybe perhaps even in the United States of America, yes, where the United States government has now said, well, we'll just open up the airspace in the United States to up to 30,000 drones in the next four years. 30,000 drones perhaps in U.S. airspace. Of course, the U.S. Pilots Association is apoplectic about it because who's going to be running the drones? Do they even know what the flight rules are here in the United States? How about uh, do we know what the reliability is about drones? I mean, we know that they crash all the time. If you really dig into it, they crash all the time. They crash in Pakistan. They crash in Afghanistan. They crash in Iran. And the Iranians have one of our most secret weapons. Yeah, yeah the Iranians have it, yeah. Well, and if they're in your backyard too. I mean, how many places in the United States do we now know that there are drone operations going on, whether it's drones that are being flown in Afghanistan or perhaps being operated in, in Yemen or operated in, in Somalia? Um, how do, are they being operated around your homes? I mean, the, the FAA is supposed to identify six different places in the United States where drones are going to be operated to practice, just to practice. Well, they'll be practicing over your houses. So finding out where, where these drones are going to be in our own country is, is most important. And it is a growth industry. It is, it is the growth industry of the U.S. military right now. It is getting funded beyond belief. It is in every aspect of the military industrial complex. The numbers of companies, over 470 companies, are now making parts of drones. And our American universities are, are churning out people who now know how to run drones. I mean, this is part of aviation. Aviation and universities, you learn how to operate drones. Is there a moral aspect of it, an ethical aspect that these young people are learning about? Probably not. Because many of these kids learn to operate drones by the killing machines that we have in our own homes, the computer games that we teach kids to kill people with, the, the ability of us now to just take a kid right from grade school, put him in front of the computer, and all of a sudden, it doesn't matter to him. You know, it's a person there, we'll just blow him up, blow him up, blow him up. In fact, the military takes advantage of that. and. And the Army Experience Center, which was in Philadelphia three years ago until 
because of citizen activism, we closed it down, a multi-million dollar operation, a recruiting tool by the U.S. military to suck in young kids going into a mall and showing them computer games. Come on in, let's see how good you are. We'll keep track of your scores. Come back every Saturday afternoon. And do you want to have a birthday party? You can have it right here in the Army Experience Center. And then when it's time for you to uh, re be recruited, we can see if you have the skill level that it takes to maybe be a drone pilot. You know? Yeah, that's what our society is coming to. And while we'll be, we'll always be asked by other people, well, you know, it's just a form of warfare. I mean, it, what's different between it and, you know, a bomber that's going over and dropping bombs? Uh, well, I think the response back is shouldn't be having those either. There shouldn't the indiscriminate use of all of these things that we're told they are precision bombs. They know we know exactly where they're going. We know exactly we can see with a drone where we're going to be dropping, and we can watch the drop the the drone be dropped right into that man's house that you had up there. We know who was in there except. Oh, whoops, maybe we didn't know who it was. And that group of people, of 80 people that turned out to be the wedding party and the people that were getting gasoline out of a truck that had overturned and there was all sorts of gasoline and people who needed gas went in a very dangerous situation just to get a gallon of gas while it's before it just gets soaked in the ground and the U.S. blows them up. So it is so important that we as, as uh, uh, concerned citizens uh, add our voices and complain about weapon systems that we don't think should exist. I mean, we've complained about nuclear weapons. We have to continue to, to complain about nuclear weapons. And Pocky was part of an anti-nuke uh, demonstration, part of the 130 30 that were arrested up at the Yankee, Vermont Yankee, you know, nuclear energy. But the nuclear weapons that we have that the United States has used on humans twice in Japan and some in Nevada and the Marshall Islands where we have, we've killed people with those weapons and we have a big movement to, to ban those and, and what we want to have is a big movement to ban these drones. So it's up to us to do it. Okay. <laughs>
also uh, on Bahrain, I'm, you probably know this, but people might not, uh, the former police chief of Miami uh, wow. has been hired by the Bahraini government. He was responsible for the, for the brutal crackdown uh, 2003 at the FTAA protest where people were tear gassed, beaten, and just Miami's you know, notorious for police brutality as it was under this guy. So I didn't know if you knew anything about what's happened since December when he was brought on. Um, you know, we're not just exporting arms, but also <laughs> personnel. John Tooby. John, thank you. Uh, one question I have is that, that you know, uh, mm, GCC kind of mediated uh, in Yemen, and they broke out a so-called you know, Yemeni solution, and now they have a, a new man <laughs> as a president, but nothing really changed, you know, and uh, uh, in Bahrain also, and uh, they are trying to broker a similar sort of dialogue, and I'm just wondering at the, you know, uh, how Bahraini people and activists are responding. I have heard of some of the parties, you know, initially a little bit participated in the dialogue and then withdrew, and uh, uh, what people are thinking about it. You know, and, and I also want to ask a uh, uh, question about Yemen too, you know, uh, where do people go from there? I think that the broker, uh, brokering of the so-called Yemeni solution uh, sort of, you know, succeeded in papering over contradictions because the main opposition party, the Islam party, basically, you know, agreed to the dialogue, you know, and uh, all of these problems that are happening are happening with the agreement between American ruling class and, uh, you know, and uh, all those Arab ruling, uh, and Arab, Arab and Pakistani ruling classes, you know, so both sides, the you know, governments need to be changed, but it's so difficult, and how do we go from here? Yeah. Maybe the to take some of the questions yeah. from Bahrain and the sure. Um, I worked for uh, the only independent newspaper uh, in Bahrain, which is Al Wasal newspaper. I was their reporter, and I was a reporter on the ground for several international media, including USA Today. The main reason why I am here is that I was actually detained personally uh, last April, actually last year, because of my reporting. <laughs> Which was insane because I'm not an opposition, by the way. I don't even say that I'm an activist or anything. I was doing my job, reporting what happened on the ground. And I'm someone who's very proficient in, my, in, the, in doing that. But obviously, you know, when governments are uh, facing this, it's like, you know, everyone is targeted. And, and I'm not an exception, by the way. They have targeted all journalists. And, and this is one of the reasons why when many of my friends and colleagues left the country and we decided to form a... Uh, Bahrain uh, Press Association for us to have a voice to say that this, these things actually happen to us. These, the government is lying. They are saying that you know none of the journalists have been targeted because of their opinion or none of them have been fired or all of that, which is something we know that it's not true. So this is so I can't now go back because they know that I am I'm still actually reporting and and uh, writing stories and and I am I I was. Uh, when I came here, I was uh, kind of low profile for a few months, but then as the lady um, said, uh, you know, Bahrain is, I think they lost it. And Bahrain is some, uh, a country where, where the uh, population, a very well educated population, by the way. These guys know what they are doing, absolutely. And, uh, you know, that's it. It's kind of, I mean, they reached the point where everyone felt that the need for them to do something because the government started to be... Um, you know, insane in their in their reactions to everything. It, it doesn't it doesn't have any logic in what they were doing. So that's what that's one of the reasons why everyone started talking, and it's now that's it. They know already. They have said. I mean, they made it clear that everyone who is speaking against any uh, the government is an enemy, and that's it. So you know, uh, the Miami police uh, officer. It's actually funny because. Uh, after all this uh, story that have been told about him and what he did in Miami and all of that, the government was so proud of uh, bringing him as an American expert, you know, to improve the, the skills of the, the officers in Bahrain. And it's awful because there have been some reports that, if, I mean, the, the practices of the policemen uh, started to be even worse after that. The, the, actually, the, the, you know, the, the torture did not stop. In fact, there are new techniques that are u being used against protesters on the streets. Um, and, and, and this is the problem. This is one example of the, what the State Department or many of the officials in the, st in the United States uh, are calling it um, right track to reform. Because this is the kind of reform that is uh, happening in Bahrain. 
reform that is just cosmetic, just that actually satisfies people maybe uh, for, and outside Bahrain. But when you go inside, when you see what is happening on the ground, nothing really changed. So, you know, people are still being tortured, but you, you have an American expert who is, you know, training them to do it. So it's nice. And then, you know, you have uh, people who went back to their works. Okay, they, they have been given their jobs back, but where are they? Many of them have been placed in different divisions with half the salary, were not being, uh, doing their, in, in a humiliating position. So, you know, this is the kind of reform that we are talking about now. But, I mean, and this is the thing that the government is saying that have uh, been implementing, and this is the thing that the government of the United States is celebrating, saying that, you know, Bahrain is in the right track and reform is in the, on the way. So this is why we are frustrated by the way that everything is manipulated, you know. Um, the dialogue is, um, yeah, of course, there have been many rumors, act actually, that there will be a dialogue, or it started already, or maybe it is going on. And uh, the latest, actually, the, uh, the, the main uh, opposition group said that, you know, we have not started dialogue, and we are not going to start a dialogue until the government release the political leaders. These guys, I mean, can you actually start a real dialogue while you have the political leaders in jail, it's, and, and obviously there were many other demands, but this was something that it's very clear, and I don't think a, a, a healthy dialogue can be started right now. It's too much, what is happening is, in, in fact, just, you know, it's very simple to start, you know, to stop torture. This did not actually stop. Stop torture. If you want to stop torture, you can do it, just, it's easy, but this, it shows many Bahrainis and uh, inside and outside that the government doesn't have uh, an, an, I mean, they don't actually want to change. They don't. They do. You need to pressure them, otherwise they won't do it, and there is not enough pressure, so they don't have to do it. So they continue with this. Okay. So, um, there are four major bases that, that uh, military bases that are um, operating drones that are in other countries right now. Uh, Hancock Air Force Base in Syracuse, New York is one of them. Creech Air Force Base in Nevada, which has been the very first one that we knew about that's been operating um, um, drones in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, Beale Air Force Base in California and Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri is one of the latest one that's kind of come on our radar screen for the activists. And I want to recognize here in the group uh, two other people that were part of what was called the Hancock 38. So, Harry and Judy, raise your hands. And is there anybody else in here? That... <laughs> and we sat in front of the front gate at Hancock Air Force Base, following on weeks and weeks and weeks of uh, weekly demonstrations that the Syracuse uh, uh, Action Group had been doing. But there were, what, several hundred people that were there on April 22nd last year, 38 of us sat down or laid down or whatever he could do. We had uh, one of the Berrigan brothers uh, is in a wheelchair, and so he <laughs> sat in his wheelchair and got arrested at 90 years old. Um, but, but the, the uh, opportunity for us to call attention to, to these drones in our communities by doing civil disobedience, by getting arrested and having one of the longest, longest drawn out judicial processes in the history of the world in this little dinky court in DeWitt, New, New York that we were up there a thousand times it seemed like but every time we were there there was publicity 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 and mm. Judy's one of the causes of it she was the, on the PR committee and I mean we got we got television we got newspaper stuff so you know trying to do these sorts of things as have has been done at Creech Air Force Base where a year ago 14 people were arrested and we had a trial in Las Vegas that got a lot of publicity there there are arrests every every couple of months at Creech, and in fact at the beginning part of April there'll be again as the as there's a walk from uh, Las Vegas out to the nuclear test site which just happens to go right past Creech Air Force Base so you've got to drop in there for an obligatory protest <laughs> for the for the, the drones there our first protest in Missouri will be held at the in the middle part of April 13 through 15 it's called the trifecta resista that we're going to do three actions in one weekend, one on the drones at Whiteman Air Force Base, one on an anti-nuke because it's Kansas City, Missouri, where this is going to be taking place, 
uh, is uh, uh, the unlucky recipient of one of the three new nuclear plants that's being built in the United States. The first time in 32 years we've started this stuff up again. Uh, so we'll have a protest at the nuclear thing and then Fort Leavenworth, Kansas is right across the river so we're going to go over there to do a little protest for Bradley Manning even though he probably won't be there. He's already on the East Coast for further trials. But uh, if you look, uh, it, virtually every, since this is the growth industry of the military, every Air Force base wants to have a drone, drone program and it's going into the National Guard bases. So it's not just active duty. National Guard are running these. And as Judy? Yeah. Well, I just wanted to briefly add that, um, first of all, Hancock uh, is a national guard yes. base. It's not a Air Force, Air Force base. And that um, on April 21st and 22nd of this year, we will be back out there. And we hope that some, of, some people will choose to join us. Uh, we're going to do workshops and then uh, have a walk out to the base and, you know, greet them uh, with our uh, understanding. I guess it's not only to get publicity, but to let them know and to let everyone know what we think about what they're doing because that is part of the thing. And, you know, I thought about it, Ann. And just recently I realized when I was putting my photos together to, for the workshop tomorrow that three people got arrested just for presenting the indictment to the base personnel. That's all they did. They said, here is our opinion of what you're doing. And they handed it to them. And Brian Terrell and Martha Hennessy and uh, Kathy Kelly were handcuffed and walked away merely for handing them a card with our, our uh, uh, opinion on it. Um, and uh, sorry, yeah. I, I had asked if I could ask a question before you said wait till the end. Can I ask my um, question? Please actually go ahead. Yes. Um, I just wondered what the status is of the court case. Are you on appeal or what? We did not appeal. Um, that was dismissed. Um, you know, we are we're considering what moves to do next after the killings. So. And, and just to, I think there are a couple more. So just on, on Yemen, you had asked about Yemen too, and you know, I think it remains to be seen. Obviously, what changes, if any, there will be, but you know, Sally was granted amnesty, the U.S. welcomed him in, into the country here. Um, some of his, I think it's his nephews who are still in charge of like, the security services, and so, you know, it's, I, I think it shows the importance of accountability and how without accountability, nothing, and without changing the power structure, nothing. And to that point, I'd, uh, I'd like to add, uh, we recently at CCR, some Yemeni activists came and visited with us, and there's some activists that we're in touch with, and what's quite uh, remarkable is the, the persistence in the Yemeni resistance. Um, uh, they still are in Tari, right, in Change Square. Um, Hood, which is a remarkable uh, human rights organization in Yemen, um, who's allied with CCR on, on a variety of, um, of, of issues around Guantanamo, around these uh, drone strikes, um, their offices were actually uh, bombarded. Um, and now they have tents right in the middle of Chain Square. Mm -hmm. They, you know, he tried to, off, you know, spin it in a positive way, say, well, you know, we have more volunteers than we've ever had, and we really are with the people. So we have people coming to us. We have mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters giving us pictures of the disappeared, of their loved ones, of protesters. Um, so we pursue uh, their, their cases, um, but they're right there and they're continuing to to fight, um, which is uh, something that David. Um, I just want to say one thing. Uh, comparing as uh, the portrayal of, of the you know the Yemeni resistance, uh, you know, uh, uh, it sometimes may be, but uh, the situation that's happening in Yemen as well as in Pakistan and, um, and uh, many places in uh, uh, West Asia and North Africa has. I think had turned out to be uh, the much more complex and uh, the, you know, the, the was like a resistance with support. And for instance, uh, the, you know, I really support the Bahrainist people's struggle. And uh, but then I'm told that the Bahraini struggle, uh, Bahraini struggle is exactly the same as uh, the Libyan struggle and the Syrian struggle and what kind of struggle. You know, I, I don't feel that uh, you know things are that similar. Maybe there are common elements, you know, but. Uh, there are other elements, you know, uh, especially now, even uh, the human rights organizations, 
organizations that used to be support, you know, the so-called responsibility to protect and uh, to use NATO's force, you know, against uh, the Libyan government and so forth, have since come out uh, kind of investigating and exposing, uh, you know, the like torture and extrajudicial executions and uh, many other problems, you know, committed by the uh, so-called freedom fighters in Libya, you know, and uh, the similar investigation was, as I think, done by the uh, Human Rights Watch about uh, uh, freedom fighters in Syria, you know, and uh, uh, this picture doesn't sit well with, you know, what I know to be a uh, totally peaceful struggle, you know, uh, of people, but, uh, people uh, in Bahrain, you know, but uh, in many cases in the media, but also in sometimes in like, uh, you know, anti-war circles, the situation's all equated, you know, a picture I think just kind of blurs the picture. And in Yemen's case, you know, yes, I agree, there are you know, many uh, activists you know, that I could support, and especially those who come from socialist backgrounds, <laughs> because I'm a socialist myself. But, you know, and however, it is true that there are cadres, <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, those people could present, you know, problems not only to the United States government, but also to people of Yemen, you know, same way I think it's in Pakistan, you know. It is true that you know, those, those, they, they may be kind of like condescending, patronizing liberals, you know, who are making a bigger thing out of, you know, <laughs> the presence of, you know, like uh, Islamists in Pakistan. However, they, it is also true that you know, those Islamists could present, and they do sometimes present, you know, problems to women, you know, and, um, minority uh, religious people and all sorts of things, you know. So while I said I do want to support, you know, the, uh, the points of view that are being presented here, but I, I do think that the things that are happening in all of the countries that are mentioned, you know, seem kind of more complex than, you know, that, uh, what's said, <laughs> if I may. I impressed I was by both the people in Bahrain, mm -hmm. about Samud, mm -hmm. and, and what you said about the, the Bahrainis who were happy to sign those petitions, and I think they're really an example to us, who the people who go out day after day and are tear gassed again and go out again the next day and go out every night singing Allah Akbar every night at 10 o'clock, knowing what's going to happen. And I think we need to be reminded that we need to have that courage too. And thank you, all you Bahrainis who continue in the face of this violence against you to stand up Samud, which is steadfast. Yes, that's good. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, certainly things are a lot more complicated to respond to your question. Um, but I think I think we have to start with the term Islamists. It's, it's an incredibly vague term, and it seems to mean a lot of things to a lot of people. And in the context of Pakistan, for example, it's, it's you know, it means everything from, you know, displays of public religiosity, which, you know, are quite harmless, um, to, you know, political parties who are part of the, uh, of the parliamentary system, to groups like Al Qaeda, and these are very different phenomena. So, to, for, so I don't want to sort of wrap them all under, you know, Islamist. Um, secondly, I mean, as far as the tribal areas are concerned, where these drone attacks are happening, um, there's a very complex set of politics going on there, and it's very difficult to know, you know, at what point one begins to call somebody a militant, right? They're intertribal politics, um, and for example. There are times that people who, um, tribes, you know, for example, there was, a, once there was a military operation there in, I think, 2004, the Pakistani military went in ostensibly to try and clear the area um, of, you know, of militants. And what, it, it created so much damage, actually, that uh, some of the tribes decided to ally with uh, people that they thought um, could, could actually protect them. Um, so now, are these tribes, you know, also militants? You know, at what point does somebody come to be called a militant? Because a lot of it has to do with internal politics that, you know, tribes are, you know, fighting with each other. There are, like, tons of internal politics going on, and they're strategizing. It has nothing to do with, you know, the, the, um, the, ide the ideology that we have in our minds of, you know, wanting to attack the, the, the United States. They just want to be safe. Um, and so, I mean, to the extent, and then yes, so, so there's that question. Yes, certainly there are people coming in, uh, the borders are quite porous, um, but who exactly, I mean, the, 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 you know, we, we never know who these people are. We don't know, um, you know, what the figures are, you know, we, we don't, we do know that a lot of people, yes, take up arms because they're under attack. So, I mean, 
Yes, they're taking up arms. Yes, they want to fight the United States. That's what's going to happen when you go into their homes and, you know, drop bombs on them consistently. Most of these people, uh, some of these kids have been actually dealing with drones. You know, they're now flying continuously, 24-7 over. There's like four to five, multiple drones, consistently over their communities. And they deal with these drones 24-7. I mean, some of these kids were like eight years old yeah. when I, the drones started. On this point, that there were none of us, you know, and it is and the, 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 right at the geography. However, excuse me, I'm so sorry. We, we really, uh, shorter comments, please. Um, very much appreciate the comment, um, but I think we were trying to look at the scope of expanding uh, U.S. wars and covert wars um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, repression that has been uh, backed, and clearly there are, there are differences, but I also think that there's a problem um, in, a, in a section of the left, and I'm not actually putting this on, on you, and saying, uh, yes, the, you know, whether, uh, and the, the, sorry, the critique of a military humanitarianism humanitarianism is well placed and I think shared and actually articulated by people on this panel including Medea who said that, you know they're being targeted um, uh, they're, please yeah just uh, they're being um, we can discuss afterwards as well they're they're, they're being uh, uh, targeted as um, as a part of a humanitarian or liberal or secular uh, uh, project um, so that critique I think is a uh, is, is shared on the panel um, but there is an issue when the the legitimate resistance of people uh, resist or the, the 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 assembly the coming to the to coming to a word I've been using today the commons right an, an effort to reclaim uh, the the commons um, reclaim uh, public space um, to make demands for, um, for 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 justice and freedom and dignity and these movements we have been seeing at a global scale whatever the differences and we have been seeing them from places like Iran and in Syria and in Libya and in Egypt and in Greece and in Spain. And, and and in the United States, um, and and there are, and these are also responses. Um, I think you can step back and look at a frame in which these are responses to uh, to many things, but including a, a, a violent neoliberal economic um, order, um, economic order, you know, and held uh, together uh, with uh, different forces of, of oppression. So I, I would just sort of I would really impress upon us to not be um, uh, dismissive of. Um, to, to, to characterize uh, people who have risen up um, in places like Syria and in uh, Libya because there has been an illegitimate uh, U.S. interventions there, inter interventions, this is military strikes, right? We must oppose those military strikes and yet not um, equate um, those uh, peoples inside um, uh, uh, governments whose uh, um, in, inside countries whose governments are nominally opposed to the United States, to so not tar them um, uh, with uh, somehow being less, uh, just innately less deserving of our support and sympathies. No doubt, there are elements among them that are um, that have a you know questionable. Uh, uh, In the sorry, please, please. I, we do have to. We, we do have to. And this, this was just a note to a certain sort of care. It is absolutely real. The brutality of an Assad is real, and and there and the. The legitimate aspirations of the Libyan uh, people for a better Syria are, are absolutely re uh, real, um, and 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 yes, and the and the intervention uh, uh, was a, was a horrific and what thirty to fifty thousand Libyan dead, which never get talked about. I think everyone in this room has an estimation of how many dead in Syria, but how many dead in Libya? Um, that there's a media blackout on that, and it's not it's not because there weren't journalists on the ground, and this is not a coincidence. But I am going to wrap up because it is late. But I will give the final word to. Actually, well, just one on, on, on because it's on the way forward. Yeah, on the way yeah. forward. I just wanted to mention, you know, the internationalization of these drone strikes, and we've talked a lot about uh, the United States. But the other part of it, and I'll just have this little thing called Palestine on my chest here, where the Israeli military has been blasting uh, the Palestinians in Gaza week after week after week, year after year after year, with these drones and. The U.S. has probably the largest drone selling market in the world, with now selling to NATO billions of dollars, but Israel has been selling to Russia, to Turkey, to all sorts of people. And Israel and Gaza, I mean Gaza is the testing ground for a lot of these techniques that are used by the U.S. military, not only for drones, but on other sorts of weapons. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all.